Okay, so people, um, everyone comes to these conferences and uh, they talk about, it's, everyone's in the blockchain industry and um, no one knows what blockchain is. You, you go to like 4,000 people and you say, what is blockchain? And they, they have some idea and um, I think most of the people in the space were uh, attracted to blockchain because um, they saw their friends getting rich or they saw one of their friends buy like uh, Ethereum or buy some... Um, some coin and then the price went up 500x or um, a lot of people were early investors in Bitcoin and um, like I've been in here for 10 years almost so <laughs> I've uh, from the beginning I've seen people uh, you know buy Bitcoin for a penny 30 cents and then it, it went up to a hundred dollars and I, rem I remember when I was living in LA like all these people quitting their jobs and they were just going out every night and partying and all these hot girls showed up and the guy quit his uh, shitty office job and he, and he, and he says, uh, I said, what do you do now? And he says, I'm a condo shopper. So he's just going around like shopping for condos or something, you know, it's just in a real job. So I think that's how most of us got into the Bitcoin space or we, we heard about blockchain. But um, in the beginning, when I started with blockchain, uh, like 10 years ago and uh, with the Bitcoin development, the, the original thing that most of the people were doing uh, with the development of Bitcoin was we were trying to take the power to print currency away from the government. And, uh, and this was a very uh, libertarian, utopian idea. And most of the people were like Ron Paul supporters. And it, it was very ironic because most, almost all the people who were working on Bitcoin also were working for the United States government. And they all had national security clearances. And they were all involved in cryptography or military this or military that. And then they're like, fuck the government, take down the government and supporting, you know, end the Fed, Ron Paul. And then after that stage, um, so Bitcoin sort of uh, didn't go anywhere. It didn't really, uh, it only grew so large within that circle. And then the next stage of Bitcoin was, um, the next stage of Bitcoin was um, when we started to have gambling apps. So we had this thing called Satoshi Dice, and then we eventually had Bitcoin Poker, and these hundreds of thousands of people started to flood into blockchain that were just basically gambling. They, uh, and they, because the United States government shut down the bank accounts of the, the major poker players, and people want to play poker online for real money, and Bitcoin was the only way for them to do that. So we had a second wave of, of Bitcoin, and then we started to have businesses come in. So in China, um, when you sell something uh, overseas, the Chinese government takes your U.S. dollar and they give, print up more money and give you yuan and keep the U.S. dollars at the central bank. And then they tell you you can't move your money out of the country. So we saw uh, there was a guy online who sells like cell phone cases and he was doing like $60 million a year of uh, export of cell phone cases to Argentina. And he was telling his customer, yeah, pay me 12 cents per cell phone case in cash so I can show a receipt for the government and I'll give you and pay me the other 30 cents in Bitcoin. And he start, and so a lot of people started to use Bitcoin because uh, the governments like Argentina were having crazy capital controls that people can't even imagine that were just stopping businesses from exporting money uh, out of the country. So I buy something and, and my money's stuck in Argentina and I don't have a company in Argentina. So how do I get my money out of the country and spend it where I need it? And uh, so we had all, and then we had a financial crisis and the big catalyst for Bitcoin, I think, was 2008. So when the, the U.S. government declared a $20, billion, uh, $20 trillion bailout and, um, and we saw that the financial markets were just like a, you know, a Ponzi scheme and there was a lot of speculation and people were panicking about whether their banks were going to collapse, we saw a lot of people moving their money into local savings banks. We saw uh, the collapse of a lot of the investment banks and we saw... Uh, a flood of money just going into Bitcoin because people were un uncertain. And then later on, Cyprus happened. So the Cyprus government was broke, or the banks were broke, and the government didn't want to bail out the banks. So the government told the banks, you could just steal your customers' money. And in one day, the, the, the government of Cyprus stole 50 over 50% of the money in people's bank accounts for the whole country. And millions of people basically just had their bank accounts stolen by this, uh, you know, by, by a bunch of broke banks. And uh, so, and that sent Bitcoin to a new high. And so, every time we have a financial crisis, uh, every time every, the currency in Turkey just collapsed 50%, um, and the Bitcoin price spiked through the roof. Venezuela collapsed. All the rich people in Venezuela moved billions of dollars of Bitcoin overnight. Um, Argentina has a financial crisis every four years, and now everyone in the whole country is moving into Bitcoin. Uh, Trump just put an aircraft carrier. Uh, on the border of Iran, and he said, if Iran attacks our aircraft carrier, we're prepared to defend ourselves. 
and all the Iranians uh, started moving money out of the country because they don't know what Trump's going to do. They think he's crazy. So um, they, they're worried that, uh, so these financial crises are driving a lot of people into Bitcoin. And, but, people, but what is blockchain is, a, is another thing. So Bitcoin is a financial asset that does really well because it's independent of governments. So I see the role of Bitcoin as a, as a neutral uh, store of value that is easier to transfer around than gold. And it's just become a standard because uh, no government can say, you can't send this money over here, you can't send it over there. And, um, and a lot of, so I think uh, it has a role in decreasing the, the transaction costs. Uh, so I started using Bitcoin initially because I was doing overseas payments and I didn't want to pay $50 for wire transfer. So I started using Bitcoin and I started paying like a few cents per transaction instead of having to, um, uh, to pay $50 to a bank. And so this started uh, Bitcoin and then, and then th this was the first generation, was just Bitcoin. Then we had, uh, and we had Litecoin and Dogecoin, Doggycoin, which is one of my favorites. And we had a bunch of just tokens and you could just send them back and forth. And they only did two things, check the balance of your wallet and send. Now in the second generation, we had uh, people who discovered that the blockchain was just a database. So people say, what is blockchain? Blockchain is actually just a database, which is very boring. If the conference was named like block, uh, block, uh, Database Cruise 2019, no one would go to this. But uh, the blockchain is just a database. And so people realized that you had to put programs or applications on the database. Just storing data is, very, is probably uh, enough to do a, a currency, but it's not enough to do an application. So if I want to do gambling, poker, I want to, uh, to build applications, I want to build a decentralized telegram, I want to build a decentralized YouTube, I can't do that with just Bitcoin. I need a, I need a, I need a database and I need a programming language. So I consider, so we had Bitcoin, which didn't have the programming language, which was a model of a database. Then we had a second generation, which is like um, Ethereum and NEO and EOS, which um, were different uh, prototypes for how a user can start their own, uh, how a user can run an application on blockchain. But these all, we saw this huge bubble. The, the market cap went up to hundreds of billions of dollars and then crashed. And a lot of the reason was these second generation platforms were unable to deliver um, what people needed. Uh, we haven't seen anyone build um, uh, digital poker. We haven't seen anyone build a decentralized telegram on blockchain yet. We haven't seen anyone build a decentralized YouTube. So um, a lot of people raised hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars in ICOs and they just simply didn't deliver on what they promised. And so we didn't see any consumer adoption in, in 2.0. We saw a lot of people coming in to speculate, to buy coins, to get rich fast. And then as soon as uh, the ICOs started failing, everyone fled out of the market and the market collapsed. And so we had a first stage, a second stage, and I think we're going into a third stage. And the third stage of, the, of blockchain is going to basically be a reaction to the second stage. And this is what I've been building basically for the last eight years. Is, and in the, in the third stage, we have several technical problems. Uh, one is getting the transaction time to be less than a credit card. So I want to walk into a coffee shop and I want to make a payment and it has to go through in less than a second. And Ethereum, Bitcoin, they can't do that because of the consensus algorithm. So we had to create a new consensus algorithm. Then um, we had to create, uh, fix hundreds of problems with Bitcoin or the, the, the model of this database and how users are gonna interact with it and a lot of things just for developers. And then we had to create a programming language because if, you're, if you just have data, it's very boring. You also need a programming language to write your applications. Then after that, you have to build up a development community and bring in college students and have 4,000 different people making 4,000 different applications to see which, which win, which application's best, um, and so on. And so you have to build up a whole ecosystem. Let's see. And um, so we, uh, so this is the wrong order. Um, so we started with our consensus algorithm, Obelisk, and this was uh, implemented by the uh, first developer on Ethereum, uh, the first person Vitalik hired who implemented Pi Ethereum. And we wanted to get away from proof of work and proof of stake because we realized that if we're going to have 100 million blockchains in the world running applications, they cannot cost $300,000 per year, uh, per month or per day to run. We have to eliminate mining costs. We have to have sub one second transaction times. The transactions have to be immutable. Once a transaction is executed, it can't be unexecuted. Uh, and so there was these security requirements that we ended up uh, having to basically develop a new paradigm for uh, distributed database consensus, which is it's very boring academic. It's like a ACM 
2.0 journal article in a you know a journal for distributed database consensus. So no one cares about this. But and the only thing they care about is you can do a block every second or five times a second. So if I'm running a poker game, I can put that on a blockchain. And so that, it's just a technical requirement. And then um, we implemented our own programming language called CX. And um, I think this is the best programming language for blockchain. I've used um, all the platforms, and most of them, uh, they raised a lot of money, and they just took whatever they could, and they duct taped it together to launch, uh, their, pro they launched their chain, like NEO or, or EOS, and they used assembly.js. This is the, uh, there's only, in the, in the industry, there's about several thousand blockchains, um, or several thousand tokens, but there's only about eight companies that have actual blockchains uh, with, with their own software. So you have Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, Lisk, Wave, Arc, uh, Skycoin, um, I think Neo, and there's maybe like one other. So of the 2,000 tokens, only maybe eight companies actually have uh, software developers and, and are platforms. And I think what's going to win eventually, what's, what's going to become the standard for everyone in the industry is going to be some type of platform. So we, uh, besides Ethereum, I think Skycoin is the only uh, company in the whole of all the tokens that um, has a programming language. And it's so um, it's, it's just crazy. And part of the reason for this is it took six years to develop a programming language. <laughs> so um, the, 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 the cycle for the development for the software is actually much slower than the cycle for the market. It's, uh, so, but um, we we just launched our development program uh, three weeks ago, and we already have 150 college students developing uh, video games and applications. And another thing that we did is we allowed every company to have their own blockchain. So in Ethereum, you have 30 transactions per second, and you are sharing the same blockchain with 150,000 other applications, and you're basically fighting with them to see who can pay the most money to Ethereum. So this doesn't actually um, doesn't actually work. It, it, it sort of was good for prototyping, but when you actually get into the real world applications, this model of shoving all the world's data into one database isn't going to work. So what we did was we developed a platform so that every person or every corporation could have their own blockchain, or in fact, as many blockchains as they want. And so we allow people to start up a blockchain just like we start up a database. And then we allow people to write the application in, um, in CX. And so this platform for us is called Fiber. And so instead of having uh, one blockchain and trying to shove all the world's data and 100 million applications on it, we give everyone their own blockchain. And each blockchain is actually 10 times faster than Ethereum. So Ethereum is doing like 30 transactions a second. And for our users, we're giving them uh, 10 times the number of transactions, and they don't have gas costs. So I think inevitably, all the application development is going to move into something like this, where each person um, has their own blockchain. And if you remember the early stages of the internet, when a web server cost a million dollars or $100,000 a month, we had uh, people using GeoCities and TriCities and you would ha or AOL pages, and someone you would let some other company host your website for you. And, um, and they would do it for free and put ads on the website. And that's sort of what Ethereum is like. Then as the cost of the web servers went down, the um, people started to have their own web servers instead of using Tri-Cities pages. And so we're making this transition from having all the web servers on like an AOL mainframe to everyone having their own personal website and own personal domains. And, and eventually you had something like WordPress where anyone who doesn't even know how to use a computer could launch their own website, launch their blog. And so I think this is going to be the second generation, is what's coming next. And then we, I don't have time to talk about this, but this is a very interesting uh, project. Uh, it's a decentralized telecom application that we've been developing. And then, um, then about two years ago, we started developing hardware. So we have an office in Shanghai. We have about 30 hardware projects. This is our miner. So we have uh, custom CPU chips. And this is actually eight computers that can each independently run a different blockchain application. We also started developing uh, single node miners. And this actually runs a custom uh, SOC chip. It's actually a, a cell phone processor. So we wanted to be able to run our blockchains basically on a, a $4 cell phone processor. And we wanted to have a large number of blockchains instead of having a, um, one huge blockchain that really can't fit on a single computer. And then we, uh, we, this is a pilot project for, um, it's like a Gotenna basically, but it's for uh, rural broadband projects like in Africa, and we're doing some NGO stuff. And this is for Skywire, which you should just look up. And this is our hardware wallet. So we started uh, 
doing research into what the production cost was, and I think we're going to be able to release a hardware wallet uh, for about $10. Uh, and this is uh, currently in our store. This is being released. It's, basically, it's very similar to the Trezor. And we're also doing, um, I think that we need to have very cheap hardware wallets because my experience was when Ethereum went up to $1,200, everyone had their coins hacked. I don't think anyone, I don't know anyone basically that um, didn't have their coins stolen. So I think we're not going to see mass adoption with a billion people holding Bitcoin or Skycoin or uh, any other currency until we have a cheap and efficient method to protect people's money because uh, you just talk to people, it's like, I got hacked, I got hacked, I got hacked, I got hacked. And um, so it doesn't matter if you made $10 million if the next day it just disappears. So, uh, so I think, th so this is uh, very important for us. Um, so anyways, I, I don't even, I only have 15 minutes, so I don't have time to go <laughs> over everything we're doing. But basically, um, um, basically, we've already launched about 120 projects um, like Apollo Chain, um, MDL.life, uh, Highcoin, High mostly in like China and so on. And um, the and I don't really know how to explain what Skycoin is because we have this hardware, we have a programming language, we have a platform, we have decentralized telecom stuff. We have a you, you know, it's uh, I think it's too complicated. It's just basically a platform. We're sort of providing the base layer uh, software that these application developers, companies, governments, and military are ba building their own private um, applications on. So we're just a, we're basically like an infrastructure provider. And we also have a token which is uh, backed by bandwidth. So I think that uh, Skycoin as a token is also going to be the first token that ends up becoming commodity backed because we're starting to see people buy and sell uh, bandwidth with the token, and we're starting to try to build up. Uh, economic activity to back the value of the token instead of just having something speculative. And um, uh, anyways, I'm done. That's it. Thank you so much, Brandon, for your presentation.